This is just a short video that shows a link between proteins and enzymes and enzyme functions. So if you've understood a little bit about enzymes before, you studied it before, you watched some of the other enzyme videos, you know that there are some factors that can affect enzyme activity, namely a pH and temperature, which are quite famous ones that can affect it. You might even know the graph already that the enzyme activity for the pH, if the pH is, let's say, uh, for a particular enzyme like amylase is neutral, which would be 7, then 7 here would be the optimum, temperature, op, uh, the optimum pH. And then either side of that particular pH, the enzyme activity will decrease. So this is the enzyme activity, if you say. Here, temperature is also a factor that can affect enzyme enzyme activity, you can see that the graph more kind of increases exponentially and then it drops off sharply. And you might know that one of the reasons why the temperature drops off sharply here is because of something called denaturation. So we'll talk about denaturation a little bit and a little bit about how you can set up some experiments that are um, related to denaturation and you can use temperature to kind of investigate this. So it turns out that one nice thing you can use in an experiment is egg white. There's a protein in here called albumin, and the protein, once you kind of heat up, if you create an egg white solution, you can create a kind of semi-cloudy egg white solution in here. And if you use an enzyme that can break down this particular protein, you can actually return it from the cloudy state uh, and make it more clear or transparent. And so that gives you a visual, it's pretty cool, a visual indication that the enzyme is actually working. So a typical enzyme to be used for that might be pepsin or trypsin in varying concentrations. I think uh, pepsin usually tends to work out pretty well. So if you link this back to what you know about proteins and protein structure and proteins are made up of chains of amino acids, this will start to make some sense. So you need to try to understand conceptually how this is all happening because you can't uh, actually see the molecular interactions, but we can see the effects of them. And so we need to understand the theory in order to be able to analyze our experiments. Heat and pH can change protein configurations. So we're talking about pH, we're talking about temperature, so we're talking about heat here. And let's try to understand uh, how this actually works out. So a couple little things. If we look down here uh, towards the right bottom, you can see my tiny little diagram. There's a separate video um, where I discuss all of this and how this all makes sense. If you remember how to draw the structure of an amino acid, it would look something like this with an NCC in the middle. Let's see three bonds there, four bonds there, a double bond because acids are cool. There's H, H, and H, and then you have an R group. Remember, this R group can be up to, uh, it can be one of 20 different R groups, which makes the 20 different amino acids that exist, basically. And if you chain these amino acids together by forming bonds in between one amino acid and the adjacent one, you end up getting something like this diagram. So if you can see here what I'm putting in my little red square, that's one amino acid connected to another amino acid, to another, to another, so on and so forth. So these are all amino acids. And the little highlighted yellow parts are what are the R groups. So I can't change this pen color for some reason. So here's one R group, there's another R group, there's another R group. You can see they all come in different shapes and forms. So it turns out if you look right here, this is a place where the R group has very nonpolar mo molecules. Actually, the R group sticking out of this bad boy and the R group sticking out of this bad boy are both kind of nonpolar. It's what I'm trying to point out with my pointer right here. And nonpolar things like to stick together, just like the tails of phospholipids in the cell membrane. They're nonpolar, they don't like water, so they tend to clump together to get away from watery polar surroundings. So this is one way that uh, these kinds of amino acids can kind of hold on to each other. And one thing you do when you raise the temperature is you start messing with these intermolecular relationships and you can cause them to break apart. So literally uh, heat can break a lot of these bonds. There's some other bonds. Here's a sulfur. It's called a disulfide bridge. It's just one of many types of bonds that, that can exist in the three-dimensional structure of a protein. There are hydrogen bonds that can exist and I've already destroyed this. Oh, yes. I can use my eraser. So uh, other bonds that can exist. Can I see any clear hydrogen bonds here? Um, here, 
some hydrogen bonds could exist, so heat could actually break those hydrogen bonds. And then you have some ionic bonds that can actually form as well too. And so ionic bonds can form between positively charged groups and potentially negatively charged groups. And so if you break these bonds, you end up changing the shape. And if you change the shape of a protein, you often change its function. And a lot of proteins need to have a specific three-dimensional structure. So if you remember, Here's our diagram of an enzyme. Here's the substrate that could bind to the active site. You change the three-dimensional structure of this enzyme, and it can no longer work. Therefore, it is said to be denatured. pH can also mess with it, because pH basically messes with the charges, uh, the, po the positive and negative charges, I guess you could say, because pH is really a measure of hydrogen ion concentration. So the lower the pH is, the more acidic. You should know that, right? Low pHs, for example, stomach acid, low pHs have uh, low pH numbers, which actually means that they have a high concentration of hydrogen ions. And you can see if I throw in a bunch of positively charged things, I could end up messing with the ionic interactions that are holding this thing together. Now, this is just one branch. The entire actual protein could be way more complex and look something like this. I'm just going to go crazy for a bit. I'm going to go crazy. Just go crazy with all of this. So if I have extra H pluses, oh, oh my, oh. Anyways, if I go crazy with adding extra H pluses by reducing the, uh, actually increasing the acidity or lowering the pH number, I'm actually confusing myself here, but lowering the pH by increasing the concentration of hydrogen ions, you can see how that can mess with uh, the ionic bonds that are in there. So that's kind of a quick explanation of how heat and pH can actually cause proteins to denature and therefore change their shape and not be able to carry out their functions. Let's go eat an egg.